The first two years were horrific. They were so confusing, so overwhelming, but I finally figured it out. And 14 years later, I could say now I have a multi-million dollar business where I help hundreds of thousands of people build businesses online. Today, we're speaking with Amy Porterfield. She's an online marketing expert, entrepreneur, New York Times bestselling author, and host of the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast. When you start your own business, you start with zero social media following, zero people on your email list, likely zero in your bank account, and also no one knows who you are. Are you willing to put down your ego and have a high capacity for zero starting over in order to get you into the life and the business you truly want? In our conversation, we discuss the state of marketing in 2023, what channels you should invest in, and how to build up the courage to quit your job and pursue your dream. Please welcome to the Founder Podcast, Amy Porterfield. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. The first question that we ask everyone that comes on is, how did you get your job, aka how did you find yourself doing the work you're doing today? Well, I need to take you back to my last nine to five job. So back in the day, I used to work for peak performance coach, Tony Robbins, and I had a really good job. I got to travel the world with Tony and his team and work on the content that he did at his events, like Unleash the Power Within, Date with Destiny. I got to work on that content and it was incredible. And what happened was I was about six years in as the director of content development and Tony decided to do a focus group and he brought in a bunch of online business owners. And I was called to the meeting to take notes. So humbling enough, I was called to the meeting to take notes. I wasn't even invited to the main big oak table. I was sitting at a side table, typing away. And Tony asked all the guys, they were all men at the table, tell me about your businesses. And at the time we were getting more into the online space. Tony had digital courses that he was getting out into the world. So he was just curious how these guys were running their online businesses. They had memberships, masterminds, digital courses. Some of them did one-on-one service work and consulting, but all of them had a digital opportunity or offer of some sort. And so Tony asked the question, tell me about your businesses. And one by one, each of these guys went around to talk about their businesses. And all I heard was freedom. They talked about calling the shots. They talked about being creative and, and building things from scratch. They talked about the people they served. They talked about the time they had to spend with their family, the money that they were making. And all I heard, like in my ears, like as loud as it could be, these guys have freedom and I did not. For the first time in my life, I realized I've always had a boss. I've always been told what to do, starting with my very strict father, all the way up to my very last boss, Tony Robbins. And so in that moment, I thought, I have no idea what they're doing or how they're doing it. And I don't know what I would ever even do but I'm going to find a way to be my own boss. And so that was the moment that changed everything for me. I think it's safe to say I took the worst notes of my life that day because all I was doing, I put my pen down or stopped typing and I was just listening. And I walked out of that meeting and I said, I got to figure this out. And it took about six months for me to think like, could I really do this? Could I really be my own boss? Could I start something from scratch? And after the fear in those first six months, I put together a plan. And so for the next six months, I put together a plan of how I'm leaving my nine to five job and starting my own business. And I did. I wrote down the date that I was leaving. It was six months from that point, And I left. I took my little white car packed with a bunch of boxes and drove off into the sunset out of the San Diego headquarters and started my own business. And the first two years were horrific. They were so confusing, so overwhelming. I cried more than anything and I was just confused, but I finally kind of figured it out. And 14 years later, I could say now I have a multi-million dollar business where I help hundreds of thousands of people build businesses online. And I found my area that I feel like I can thrive, but it was a rocky road to get here to say the least. Mm, yeah, so I um, I remember listening to an interview of yours a very, very long time ago. And I never forget this story that and concept you talked about around burning the boats. Can you share about that? Because yes. I think sometimes you've kind of, there's many different ways you can start your own business and you can do it while you're on the site and working your day job on the side, or you can just go and go and, go and do it. And I'd love to hear your concept of burning the boats. So I learned this from Tony and he used to talk about it a lot on stage and I just took it with me into my own business. 
And it's this concept that when you want something really bad, and in my case, I want to be my own boss. I wanted to start a business. I wanted freedom. When you know what you want and you want it bad enough, you have to storm the island and burn the boats, meaning there's no way to go back. And for me, burning the boats meant I wasn't going to take uh, consulting work at Tony Robbins. I wasn't going to just dabble in my own business for a while, but keep my nine to five job for the next few years. I was literally going all in, sink or swim, I was making it work. And when you burn the boats, you don't have that opportunity to turn back. So the only thing you can do is look forward and figure it out. And it's tough and awkward and messy, but you will get there. And I really do believe on uh, burning those boats. Mm, yeah, I um, I took a different approach, much more risk adverse. I kind of started a founder on the side and then over time, like built it up, took about a year. But I'm curious, like with that concept, uh, you know, real world application for you, you said the first two years were really hard. What what happened? So what happened was I went out on my own. And one of the questions a lot of people ask when they're thinking about starting their own business, leaving their nine to five job is, what would I do? And so the way you did it, I actually think is the better way. Burning the boats is important, meaning you can't keep going back. But I like the slow progression of making it work over time. Now that I'm more mature and a little bit more stable, I'd probably choose that way versus the way I did it. But even so, whatever way you choose, I I didn't know what I would do or how I would make money. And the only thing that I felt like I was good at is helping people with their social media. I had started to do more social media inside the Robbins organization. So I thought, and it was, it was at a time where Facebook was the Wild West and everyone and their mother was a social media manager. And so I thought, well, I'll do that. And so I left and I started as a social media manager. But one of the things I didn't know how to do was unboss myself. And this concept of unbossing is believing that you can lead yourself. You do not need anyone else to tell you what to do or how to do it. You will figure it out. You have agency. You have enough courage, probably not confidence yet, but enough courage to keep moving forward. You can be your own boss. But the process of unbossing takes time and a lot of missteps along the way. And so my my example of that is I left behind a nine to five job, went out on my own and started to take clients doing their social media. But I was so used to having a boss that I let my new clients treat me like I was their employee. I was saying yes to everything. We'd get on a call. I'd have 20 action items to their one action item. They'd call me at 10 p.m. I'd answer the phone. No boundaries. I was a yes girl. I was acting as though they were my boss until I was so burned out. I thought I hate this business I created. I might as well go grovel back to get my job back because this is not working. And it was because I didn't know how to have boundaries and be my own boss and build a business that actually would bring me joy. So the first two years were rough. The second year of my business, I made less than I made at my corporate job. The first year I made about the same. The second year I made less. So I was going backwards until I finally figured out, wait a second, I got to change this business model. This is not working for me. Mm. So you wrote a book about leaving called Two Weeks Notice. What compelled you to write that book? It was those first two years. The first two years of building my own business, like I said, very confused, very overwhelmed, burned out by year two because I didn't know what to do. And I, I, you don't know what you don't know. So I was just clueless. And of course, I was watching the YouTube videos and trying to piece it all together, comparing myself to everybody online. But when I got 14 years in and now I have a successful business, when I thought about writing a book, because I think most entrepreneurs think about if I ever wrote a book, what would I write about? I had no idea for many years. And then one day I thought I was dealing with a client who was really struggling to get her business up and running. And I thought if I just could give her the guidebook of how to get started from scratch, even when you're still in your nine to five job, that is the book I wish I had. Because in my book, Two Weeks Notice, the first part is how to build a runway to leave your nine to five job with integrity and with courage and with a plan. And so there's a runway you can put together, many things you can do. So the day you drive off, you feel confident that you're ready to go in your own business. And then the rest of the book is 
how to start a business from scratch, all the basics that you need to get into place that I skipped or struggled with. So I wrote the book that I wish I had in my first two years of building my business. You have a really popular podcast called Online Marketing Made Easy. And, uh, you know, the state of marketing has really changed. Like we've got all sorts of tools around AI and how you can use these tools to help you create things faster than ever. We've got all sorts of creators popping up, the creator economy. There's more creators than ever. There's more channels than ever. And it feels like it's the noisiest it's ever been. And content creation is really easier than ever. So I'd love to hear your take of the state of marketing in this current point right now, mid-2023. Yes, you are so right. There's so many opportunities, so many exciting things that are happening in the online space. And one of my secrets to success, and I think that's helped me immensely, is I feel as though I do a really good job of staying in my lane, putting my head down, always learning, always growing, but not allowing myself to be fully distracted and pulled off of the goals that I set for myself. So what I mean by that is that I think that AI is hugely important and I believe we all should be embracing it. I teach people how to create digital courses. I think AI is going to allow us to create our own digital courses so much faster. But what I see some people do is they're building their businesses, they're going along and they think, oh, I should get into that world now. And so they're abandoning what's working in their business, what they've been doing, because they want to try something new and they want to start something new. And it's the death of an entrepreneur is when you are always starting from scratch. When you have to reinvent the wheel, start from scratch, it slows you down. And so I think these opportunities are important, all the platforms, all the new things that are coming out. But ask yourself, how can I use them in terms of what is working in my business now versus starting over, starting from scratch, getting excited about a whole other project that was never, ever part of the plan this year? So every year, just like most entrepreneurs, we set our goals and the business, but we take them very seriously so that when new opportunities come throughout the year, they don't get a huge place on our plate until we finish what we started. And I really do believe keeping our eye on the prize, staying very true to the goals we set at the beginning of the year has helped us immensely get to a multi-million dollar business. When I was listening to an Oprah Winfrey podcast many years ago, she was being interviewed she said something that has stuck with me to this day. She said, we built the Oprah Winfrey Network. We built it, or actually the talk show first that she had, Harpo, we built it by being racehorses. Racehorses have blinders on. They can't look left or right, only forward. And so she said, we run our business like racehorses so that we can't look at what everyone's doing. We can't worry about what everything else is going on we stay forward. And when an opportunity comes that we can use to further this, what we're working on, we'll take it. If not, it's got to wait until we're ready to set the new goals. And so we run our business like a racehorse and it's helped immensely. Mm, that's great advice. So what advice would you share for early stage startup founders, people that are you know, just working on something or about to launch something when it comes to choosing a channel? Do you, do you recommend going on multiple channels to begin with or just starting with one? Comes back to your goals, of course. What channels do you think are great for the now? I'm keen to hear. Yes. So I'm a big proponent of keep it simple and get fancy later. And so when I say keep it simple, I would say one platform at a time. Now, I know it's very difficult. And as entrepreneurs, we love variety and to do it all. But what I see is people just dabble a little here and there and never go fully all in with anything. So right now, I think Instagram and TikTok are where it's at. I think both of those, you can get amazing traction with either platform. And for most of the content creators that I see online, that's where they're really thriving. But I would just choose one. And even, I mean, just 90 days. If you're not on any of them, give 90 days to go all in with one of them before you decide to add another. And if you can stand it, even longer. But my real answer is, I don't think it's really the platforms that matter as much as your email list. One of the biggest mistakes that I made growing my business, and this is what I see so many of my students doing, is neglecting the power of your own email list. When you go all in, let's say with Instagram, you are building your business on rented land. 
At any time, Mark Zuckerberg, or let's say you choose Twitter, Elon, can change the algorithm and boom, the way you've been doing business and making money can change overnight. And I don't know about you, but I sure as heck don't want some stranger on the internet changing how I'm making money and making an impact. And so I love to use the platforms as a way to get awareness and as a way to drive people deeper into my world. But I use social media to get people on my email list because your email list converts at least four times higher than any social media post when done right. And those are the people that are going to be most loyal to you. And so your email list is one of the most important assets in your business. And for most entrepreneurs, it's the most neglected in the first few years. And if you want to get that edge, if you want to get ahead of your competitors, start growing your email list yesterday. That's how important I think it is. Mm. When it comes to email marketing, what kind of basic tips do you have for our audience? Because I know sometimes people do build their email list, but they're perhaps afraid to mail frequency all sorts of things. This is what I hear all the time. Amy, I've started to grow my email list, but I don't know what to do with them. So to back up a little bit, just the basics of growing an email list, of course, you need an email service provider. And of course, you want to create something that is valuable, that people will give up one of the hottest commodities, which is a name in an email. Who wants more emails from people they don't really care to hear from? And so people are going to be selective on who they give their name and email to. And so you want to create something of great value that people would be willing to pay for, but you're giving it away for free. Maybe it's in the form of a PDF, a guide, a cheat sheet, a checklist, or maybe it's a 10 minute audio meditation if that's your niche, or it's a quick 15 minute video on how to do something, but it's something of great value. So the software is important. A lead magnet is absolutely important. And it's important that you talk about that lead magnet everywhere that it matters and often. It's not once a week, but it's a few times a week. It's in an Instagram reel. It's in the bio of your social media. You do a live video, you might mention it at the end. You're interviewed somewhere. If they allow you, you talk about it there. And so you want all these different opportunities. One lead magnet can go a long way if you're talking about it often. But the question, again, that I get is, okay, me, I'll do that. I start to grow my email list. Let's say I have a thousand people on my email list. What am I emailing them? Well, the first rule is I think you need to email them every single week, at least once a week, maybe two, but once a week you can start out with. The cadence of your email is important. Every Thursday at 8 a.m., you'll find that I'm sending out an email. Rain or shine, I'm not missing it. People come to expect it. But what am I emailing? Well, I really do believe that everybody sh everyone should be creating original content in the form of a podcast or a blog or a video show, or maybe if you're really new, just an IG Live or Facebook Live that you do once a week. But you need to have weekly original content. And here's why. It does two things. Number one, it attracts an audience. So every week, if you're showing up, let's say with a podcast, you're attracting new people into your world. But it's also serving the people that are already in your community that you want to become their go-to source. So a weekly podcast does two things, really, really important things, attracts a new audience and serves the audience you already have. And so every Thursday, I email my entire email list and I let them know I've got a new podcast and here's why it matters to you. And so they are used to getting my email. I might tell a story, give a quick tip and have them click and go listen to the podcast. The weeks, if I were to miss that, years ago, I missed a few and my downloads went down on my podcast. It makes a huge impact. We went from 500,000 downloads a month to over a million in a, in a very short period of time last year when we got really diligent on a few key strategies. And that emailing every week is very, very important. But that's what you're emailing them. You're emailing them information to go check out your latest original content, whatever that might be. Yeah, awesome. And uh, just on the topic of marketing, we talked about AI. I'd love to hear like, People always looking for tools. What tools are you guys using right now or anything that you can share? And how can you suggest for businesses to incorporate AI? So one of the things that we are putting together actually is something that we're like deep into is finding the different prompts that you can use to create a digital course from scratch. 
And so we're starting to play around with what would the prompts look like to come up with a topic for your digital course? What would the prompts look like to fully outline that topic into, let's say, three to five different modules? And what would it look like if we used AI to come up with some bonus ideas for when we're promoting the digital course? What would bonus ideas look like to get people to jump into your course and want to pay for it? And so we're starting to put together a lot of prompts for my students on ways to use AI to get that course up and running quickly. But AI isn't the only tool that we're really focused on right now because there's a lot of other things that are happening in the online space that are working like gangbusters. And one of those is to get more engagement in your DMs. And so we started to work with a company a few months ago where they fully automated our DM strategy. And so you can do this without working with the company, but we wanted to kind of take it to the next level. So for example, if I'm on Instagram and I'll say, okay, I created this brand new freebie all about how to quit your job and start your own business. And if you DM or if you comment the word dream job below, I'll send you a link to get it right away. So on the on the post, they just type in dream job. A DM is automatically sent to them with the link for my freebie that they sign up to get it. And then I continue to follow up in the DMs, getting them more and more engaged in the business. And this DM strategy has not only grown my email list, but has also helped me be really specific about the needs of my students and what I can offer them. And so I love opportunities to get those conversations started. Now, you might say, but Amy, it's all automated. It is, but I'm also very active on Instagram. So they still see me showing up. They still see me doing lives. But in the DMs, we've gotten it really dialed in so people are talking to us and letting us know what they need. So that's been a new strategy this year that's been working really well. Yeah, well, that's gold. Thank you for sharing. So love to switch gears, talk about... I guess, leaving your job. Um, it's a very scary thing for many people. Yes. Talk us through how you can kind of go through the process of of getting over that fear because it, it's crippling and paralyzing and it holds a lot of people back. And, and sometimes they have the aspiration, but they're just too comfortable in their in their day job, but they really want to start a business. And it's it's really scary. So can you talk us through... Any practical tips or advice to even, yeah, work through that? Yes. When I first had the thought in that one meeting that I wanted to go out on my own, I was paralyzed with fear. And the first thought, I actually, this is a true story. I turned to one of my best girlfriends that I work with at Tony Robbins. She was in the meeting as well. And I turned to her and I said, I want to start my own business one day, but I have no skill that would ever translate into building my own business. And I, I believed it, like I'm a corporate girl and she was a writer. And I said, you're a writer, you could go on on your own and be a freelance writer and do cool things. I don't have any skill. Now, fast forward to today, and I believe that everybody has a skill to build an online business. We just need to tap into it and spend a little time to develop it. But I was very, very wrong, but that came from fear. I was born uh, in a time where a, a regular paycheck meant everything. Like my dad, he was a firefighter. My mom was a hairstylist, blue collar to the bone. You would never think about going on your own and leaving behind health insurance and a paycheck. And so it was a very wild even thought for me to have and riddled with fear. However, the way that I move forward and the what I teach in my book is twofold. Number one, you have to create a compelling why. This is something we've heard in the entrepreneurial space a lot, but when you're wanting to leave a job, you have to have a compelling why. Because on the days that your worries knock you down, your why needs to pick you back up. So through that six months, when I finally decided I'm going to do this, there were many days that I would look at my husband, Hobie, and I would say, maybe I don't need to quit my job. Maybe I could just start a side hustle and kind of just dabble with that for a few years, but I could keep this job. And he'd say, okay, that's great. You can, but remember what you wanted more than anything. You wanted more freedom. You wanted to be home at a decent hour and spend time with our family and eat dinner with everyone. You wanted your weekends off. You wanted real vacations. All of that I wasn't getting at the time in my nine to five. And I wanted to make more money. I wanted to bust through the glass ceiling. So my why was very clear. And so that is the first thing you need to start out with. But also you need a plan. And without a plan, you're just going to dream about it, but never do anything about it. So in the book, I map out a runway. 
And one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to choose an exit date. Now, it might be three months from now, six months, nine months, or a year. Nothing more than a year becomes an excuse. But you're choosing a date that you're driving out of that parking lot and never coming back. And so when you choose that date, you put it on a post-it note. And you put it on your mirror or wall or whatever where you're going to see it every single day. For me, it was six months out. And when I would look at that date, it was in June 2009. When I look at that date, I'd say to myself, what do I need to do today to move me closer to getting to that date? Because I'm doing it no matter what. What do I need to do today? And let me give you an example. One of the things I did while I was still at my job is I found a woman online that was building a business much like the business I wanted. She had digital courses. She had a mastermind. She was doing cool things online. I wanted a business like that. So I started to kind of befriend her, uh, be, uh, be friends with her online. And then I sent her a DM and I said, look, I know you don't offer this on your website, but can I pay you for an hour of your time to talk to you about how you built your business? I just would love to know more. And she said, yes. And so when the time came for the call, there was really thin walls at the Tony Robbins office. And I had this tiny little office. I got under my desk. And I had, I didn't have a cell phone. I had a phone that was literally attached to, you know, old school phone. When was the last time you used one of those? So I had the cord underneath the desk and I'm whispering to her, like, tell me how you built your first digital course and how did you get started with social media? Like I was asking her all the questions and she answered all of them. And so that was one thing I could do to move me closer to that date. Another thing is I started to attend marketing events. So on my off time, when I had the chance, I would go to marketing events to meet new people. And the third thing I did that helped me immensely was that I started to ask if I could help in other areas. So I was the director of content, but the company was shifting at the time. And I asked to move over to the marketing department and work on the campaigns for their digital courses. And they said yes. And I was scared to ask and I thought they're never going to allow me to. And they did. So I got to get into the action of where I knew I eventually wanted to go with my own business. So it's taking risks. It's putting yourself way out into the uh, the uncomfortable zone and just to really get out there and uh, see what you can make happen. But if you don't ask, it never happens. So those are some of the things that I did. Mm, I really like that uh, you showed the initiative to reach out to somebody that is a couple of steps ahead of you. You are, you reached out, but not only did you reach out, you actually was respectful of that person's time and you pay, and you offered to pay them for their time. I think oftentimes it's easy just to send somebody a message and be offended if you, you ask them to catch up or you want to pick their brain or whatnot. But that's actually really clever because if you're respectful of somebody's time, oftentimes they're more likely to want to help you. I'm curious, talk to me around like mentors and people that you learn from now. So I am a big believer in you shouldn't do entrepreneurship alone. It could be so lonely, very isolating, especially for just doing business online. There's really no reason why I need to step out uh, out from this computer in order to make the kind of money I make. However, well, I shouldn't say it like that. There's not a lot of reasons why I need to step out, but I know that I'm going to be better and I'm going to grow when I do. And I'm an introvert. I'm a homebody. So I have to really push myself. But I really believe in mentors and getting in proximity with people. So to in order for me to have a multi-million dollar business, I have a health coach that I meet with every other week. I have a business coach that I meet with every other week. I have a therapist that I meet with when needed. And I have a mastermind group of my peers that we get together a few times a year. Those are all necessary for me to show up as my very best self, but also to not reach burnout or not get so overwhelmed or confused and not know what to do that I just want to jump ship. Because there have been days like that I just think I can't do this. Actually, let me tell you one quick story. I hate to tell this story. It's a chapter in my book that I did not want to write. And I still cringe a little that people know this, that this happened to me. But what I did, I was about three years into my business. It was, I think, around 2012 at the time. And I had almost hit a million dollars in my business. And that's a really big deal for an entrepreneur to hit the million dollar mark in revenue. And so I was like, so, so close. 
And at that time, I was in a mastermind. So I've done masterminds since the day I started this business, always finding either I paid for them or with my peers, always finding ways to collaborate and get in proximity with people. I was in a mastermind with my peers and there was this guy in the mastermind that I really liked and he was doing big things in his own business. And I pr presented an idea like, what if you help me do that in my business and you take a little cut? And he came back with, what if I become a partner in your business and we blow it up and I'm, I do what I'm doing here, but on a bigger level with you, we could do amazing things. Now, I'd like to tell you that it took me weeks and weeks and lots of consulting with my mentors to make the decision to take him into my business as a 50-50 partner. But what, it, what I did is I took one night's sleep and I said yes the next day and we were off to the races. And the reason, looking back now and a lot of therapy later, the reason I said yes is I was scared to do it on my own. Things were starting to happen. I was really going. It was building. And what if I mess it up? What if it all is taken away from me? What if I can't do it on my own? And it kind of goes back to my days of wanting a boss or doing well having a boss. My business partner that I took on in a business I'd created, he became my boss this is not his fault. I did this to myself. All my fears were just right there at the surface and I let him treat me like he was my boss. And all of a sudden I became a yes girl again. And for years, my business did explode. We did amazing things together. He was a great guy, but I lost myself in that. And one day I woke up and I realized this is not what I want. I don't want a business partner. I'm not even showing up as my true self. I don't want to answer to someone else. This is not working. And when I went to him to tell him I want out of this, it became a disaster. We didn't really have enough things in place to make it easy to get out. And we started to kind of battle on how this was going to happen. And a year into battling how we're going to break up, I almost lost my entire business that I started on my own. We almost had to dissolve the whole thing because I made a decision based on fear and feeling I wasn't enough to do it on my own. And I also wasn't savvy enough to put the legal things in place to protect myself. And so that happened. I was miserable for an entire year. And then finally, we came together through mediation and I got my business back. And it, it feels like yesterday. I remember calling my husband after hours of mediation and I said, the business is mine again. And everything changed. I went from $5 million to $16 million in about 18 months because I finally stepped into being my own boss and owning it. But the embarrassing part of that story is it took me a long time to believe that I could actually run this business on my own. And so I'm dedicated to helping other people realize they have what it takes to do it on their own, even when it gets hard. Yeah, that's an incredible story. Thank you for sharing, Amy. Um, I got I to delve a bit deeper. So how would have that worked? Because you you are the brand like the like like the we don't you don't really have a business if if it was dissolved and you could just start again like that's bizarre so yeah so it was an interesting partnership because in many ways he was a silent partner a lot of people didn't even know i had a partner and for sure my students didn't know it wasn't something we advertised and i was the face of the business and so when we started to talk about how we're going to break this up because we weren't agreeing with the, the dollar amount, I, I have to buy him out. And so we weren't agreeing with that or how it might look, what he could take, what I could take. Even though it was my brand and my business and my content, this is why I really struggled with it. And I haven't talked about this anywhere else. This was my baby. I, I, this was, I created the formulas, the models, the content, the products. That all came from me, my own experiences, and my own knowledge. But he, I agreed to bring him in as a 50-50 partner and he was a machine that absolutely helped us grow our business. So I did that. So there was a lot of shame that I got myself into this place, but legally, because we were a 50-50 partner, if we didn't agree, that business had to go down. But here's where the part of the story I didn't tell you. One morning I woke up in the midst of a year of us battling it out, trying to figure out what was going to happen. And when I say battle it out, we weren't mean to each other. We just weren't agreeing with each other. And when that year was happening, I woke up probably nine months into that year and I said, I will burn it down and build it back better. If that's what it's going to take, I will burn this down and build it back better. And in that moment, that is where I realized, wait a second, I finally believe in myself. I finally feel that I can do this. 
And I, what I look at it now is I had a very high capacity for zero. And this is something I teach my students. The higher or stronger your capacity for zero, you cannot lose. And what I mean by that is, even though many people listening right now, they're really good at what they do. They've got knowledge and skill sets and trades that they're doing really well, likely maybe in a nine to five job. But when you start your own business, you start with zero social media following, zero people on your email list, likely zero in your bank account, and also no one knows who you are. Are you willing to put down your ego and have a high capacity for zero starting over in order to get you into the life and the business you truly want? And when I realized, oh, my capacity for zero after all this agony has just shot up to the highest, I will start over, I couldn't lose. I was literally in the driver's seat. And I think that's what got me to where I am today. Mm, yeah, I love it. Thank you for sharing. And uh, thank you for being so open, honest, and vulnerable. Uh, it's an interesting story. So um, you talk about mindset. I, I think mindset is is everything, right? If you want to build a $100 million year business, you want to build a million dollar business, you want to leave your day job that's not fulfilling to you, the work you're doing is not fulfilling, you want to be your own boss. Half of the battle is actually if you believe you can do it in your mind. Yes. Talk to me around how you've been able to cultivate and develop your mindset because it sounds like you've been through some challenges like everybody has. Right. Also, one thing that is, I was going to say unique about me, it's absolutely not unique. It's, I think it's very common, but it's something that I deal with. I've always had a low level uh, depression. It's just a little bit of a black cloud that follows me and I can manage it, but it's there. And I absolutely ha deal with anxiety. So these are two things that just show up for me, no matter how good my life is, they're just there. And so because of that, I've had to lean into taking care of my mental health, probably more so than I'd like to admit. And so for me, I believe, and I learned this from Tony, 80% of your success as an entrepreneur is your mindset. 20% is the mechanics. So I could have all the strategies and techniques in the world, but if I don't believe I am worthy of this success or that I can figure this out, then that's not gonna work. Um, many, many years ago, my son was really little at the time and I had done my very first successful launch and I made $30,000 with a digital course in like mm, two weeks. And I thought I was the richest woman in the world, like $30,000 in two weeks, like, holy cow. And I remember telling my husband and he's like, what? This is wild. And that night, my son was playing around in the kitchen. He fell and cracked his head on the tile and we had to go to the emergency room. He had a brain bleed. And in my head, I said, see, something good happened. So that's why something bad happened. I genuinely did not believe that I deserved that kind of success. And that's the kind of thing that could kill an entrepreneur, not believing that I deserved it. And when I caught that, I was like, oh my gosh, those two had nothing to do with each other. I just had a successful launch and my sweet boy got hurt. They had nothing to do with each other. But somehow my unworthiness, feeling unworthy, found its way into those two were directly related. That took a little therapy to get over, or maybe a lot. But through that, finding out, oh, this is an issue for me, I study the brain or how my brain works all the time. I'm listening to the podcast, reading the books, doing the therapy. I work on myself so I can be a badass leader in my business and make lots of money and lots of impact. But it starts with me doing the work, whether it's a morning routine, it's the therapy, it's getting with my mentor. All of that matters because my mindset is more important than all the strategies I do in my business. Yeah, I agree. So have you experienced burnout before? And if so, how did you get through it? Multiple times. I don't think I'm ever not going to at some season. So I'll tell you two. The first one is the first two years of my business. I experienced absolute burnout because I had the wrong business model for me. I was doing one-on-one -on -one service work, doing social media, and I switched to selling digital courses. And that was a better business model for me and got me out of the burnout because I believe digital courses, when you do them right, creates a lot of freedom in your world when you turn them on evergreen. So that was my first burnout. But I actually recently experienced a little bit of burnout um, 
because I launched a book. So I launched two weeks notice for five months. I started in October and I went hard all the way to February. I wanted to be a New York Times bestseller. I wanted this book to get in, in the hands of thousands and thousands of people. I knew it could change lives. So I went all in and that is my personality. I'm not gonna half-ass anything. I'm gonna go all in or I'm not gonna do it at all. That's not always the healthiest way, but it absolutely is in my DNA. And so I went hard for five months. And once that book came out, and I'm happy to say it hit New York Times bestseller, it was amazing success. But about two weeks after, I looked in the mirror and I felt like a shell of a person. I had been single-minded minded on this one thing. I knew I had neglected my health and my family, not to an extreme. I've been doing this long enough to know I'm not going to take it there. But it, it was a moment that I thought, whoa. Two things. Number one, I instantly forgave myself. I believe that we all have seasons of heightened anxiety or stress doing big things that matter to us. Some of us just go through those seasons. The important thing is, and the number two thing that I realized in that moment is, I got to allow myself to have a moment to get back to normalcy. So I took time off. I talked to my therapist a little bit more. I eased up on the campaigns we were doing in my business till I felt I was in a place of groundedness, like I felt solid. I didn't know how to do that in the first two years of my business. I know how to get out of it now. But yeah, I still find myself kind of going a little bit harder than I'd like to admit. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing. Look, we have to work towards wrapping up, Amy. We're going to move to the hot seat round, just rapid okay. fire. It always makes me nervous, answers. but I'm ready. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, what daily habits make you a better founder? absolutely moving my body, whether it be lifting weights or walking on the treadmill. I have to move my body to be a better founder. When are you most happy at work? Ooh, I love this question. When I am creating content, creating a masterclass or a webinar, I am in my happy zone. What's something you've learned today? Ooh, I love that. We are making a really hard decision in my business today to either cut something or keep it. And I learned today that I thrive in big decisions. And so I felt really good about a really scary decision we need to make today. And I told myself, oh, this is where I show up the best. So I kind of learned a little something about myself today. No doubt you're cutting it, I assume. I, yes. How did you know? <laughs> because a, cause a common problem for founders and the kind of business like like your similar to founder is, is it's fun to create, it's fun to do more, but oftentimes you just need to simplify things to be able to go faster and yeah, it's and just That's focus on the core. exactly what's happening. You read, you read right through me. <laughs> uh, last question. If you could have dinner with any entrepreneur, dead or alive, who would have been why? Oh, I feel like my answer is so cliche, but any day, Michelle Obama. I love her so much and I think she's incredible, both business sense and personal sense, how she runs her personal life and her business. I'd love to sit down with her. Awesome. Well, Amy, we will wrap there. Thank you so much for giving us your time, just sharing all of your incredible stories and all that you've done and the impact that you make. I really appreciate your time and this is gonna help a lot of people. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Hey, Founder Fam, did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.